Welcome to Bergonomics, demystifying economics with Ross McDowell. Welcome to the Bergonomics podcast. I'm your host, Ross McDowell. In 2022, Australia's live performance industry is valued at approximately $17 billion, employing nearly 65,000 people. One segment of the live performance industry is the Outdoor Music Festival. With me today is a longtime friend who promises to demystify the economics of Australia's most successful outdoor live concert brand, A Day on the Green. Michael Newton, with his wife Anthea, founded A Day on the Green 20 years ago. A Day on the Green is held in predominantly rural winery locations, having a profound effect financially and psychologically on the communities that host A Day on the Green. It's like a mini economic tornado hitting a rural area. In those 20 years, Mick has produced 500 outdoor music events with 4 million ticket sales and some of the biggest names in Australian and global music. Mick, welcome to Bergonomics and help me out with some of those marquee acts you've hosted in the past and in the future. G'day Ross and um, thanks for having me on Bergonomics. Um, I don't know if I'm going to demystify it or make it even more confusing for your listeners, but um, yeah, it's been a wild ride over the last 20 years and um, uh, you know, I, we just thought it was a good idea at the time. Instead of playing in parks or, um, you know, where you can you know, step on dog shit or people are kicking the footy, we thought a, the romantic ideal of a concert in a winery was a good one and actually t- took a leaf out of Lewin Estates' book who had been doing jazz and opera type stuff. And I used to be an agent at Premier Artist um, working for Michael Gadinsky and, you know, I thought contemporary lineups in a winery setting was something that might be good because a lot of my artists were older and they couldn't get on any festivals back in, t- in the year 2000 and they were quite frustrated. So it was kind of created for those artists that I represented and also from an, um, a punter's perspective, you know, me being the, the, the core demographic, you know, I was just sick of going to pubs and clubs and having a band come on at 11 or 11.30 at night. And, and that was all, was an offer then? It's kind of. It wasn't, there wasn't much else, you know. Um, there was Blues Fest, you know, there was the Big Day Out, there was Home Bake. Um, like I said, you know, nothing for an older audience or even an older artist. Um, and, and with my live background and, and Anthea, my wife's um, publicity background, we kind of thought that it would be uh, received well, received well by artists, received well by wineries, by the local councils, um, by media. Um, it just was a, was a seed of an idea that we thought had legs. And, you know, here we are, I'm talking to you 21 years later, having done 500 shows. So give me an idea mm. of the size of the enterprise. How many events per year? How many states? How mm. many, and, and you've done some in New Zealand. Mm. Mm. Um, how many people in terms of to t- produce one, mm. one event? Give me an idea of it. Well, our, our venues or wineries... You know, the smallest one's probably 8,000. The biggest one's, you know, 20,000 plus. Most are in the range of like around between 10 and 15,000. Okay. Um, this year we'll only probably do about 22 shows this summer. Uh, there have been summers where we've done 40 plus when we were really hitting New Zealand hard. There was one weekend I remember we had uh, Diana Kral touring and Tom Jones at the same time and it was a long weekend <laughs> and we had six shows in one weekend which is really mental and we, you know we were you know chartering planes and in and out of air, you know airports at god knows what hours it was too, anyway that was that was too much it was too much and it's it, it, like we, we've always been clamoring after the growth you know it's been a very organic growth but we've always been just you know for a long time we've always been just behind it but now we're in we're in a, we're in a real um a sweet spot where i've got uh you know probably 10 full-time staff in the office yep. then we'd have uh maybe another half a dozen subcontractors who mainly work for a day in the green but then 
they might spear off and do, you know, Splendor in the Grass or Blues Fest or, you know, um, some other shows that are out of the day in the green season, but they mainly work for us. Um, How long does it take yeah. to put together one show? Well, it, dep it really planning? depends. Sometimes we've had turnarounds of like three months where I remember we did some shows with John Fogarty and it happened very quickly. You know, it was like we confirmed it in June, we put it on sale in July and it happened in November. You know, Gee, that's amazing so, in so, terms of what the work involved that you can just quick, turn it over that quick, quick. turnaround yeah and, and other times you know we'll be working on tour for two or three years really before it actually happens um you know rod stewart's a good example where we had him coming pre-covid um the tour got post you know and that and before that we were probably talking about it for six months before that so i don't know where were we 2018 19 we started talking about it got postponed got cancelled the second time because of the second wave and you know here he is he's coming in 2022 in March so that, that that one was a long time coming other artists we've sort of talked about for a long time and then ended up confirming you know um, and then doing tours with um, it, it sort of varies but what I've lost the thread of your question but um, you know we've got yeah and on the day um, you know apart from the full-time staff and the subbies that I just mentioned then we'll have you know um, Oh, mate, I can't, like 100 security, you know, 200 bar staff. Which you uh, draw a lot of those people from the local areas. Yeah, that we do. In, yeah. in terms of the local economy and the areas that you're in, mm. what, roughly what sort of percentage of, mm. of your people on site mm. would be local? Mm, that's a good question. Sometimes, you know, um, you've, got to, you've got to get security from... I'm just thinking of security from from Melbourne to go to a show like uh, Albury or Geelong, um, but certainly bar staff, um, you know, some ushers, some some people on the ticketing gates. Um, we, even in Orange, we get you know the local rugby union club to help us load in the stage gear, which sure. is which is great. Okay. We always try and engage like a a, a local club where we can you know donate some money for them just with just when we need hands-on kind of you know work, workers um yeah it, it's hard to put put a, a number on it but i know you know have a, a council did a study for us and um if if we have say ten thousand people a show um aside from what's spent at the show on tickets and booze and food and etc and merch at the show the spend would be 250 dollars a head injected into a local economy so that could be you know two and a half million dollars for is that right yeah for ten thousand people um but you know anecdotally we hear that you know accommodations are always booked out in the hunter valley or in orange or around geelong and, and you said there's pressure when you haven't held a show in an area mm. uh, venues come back to you and say mm. hey we, we want you back. What's yeah. going on? We will spend money, capital money, good yeah. money, yeah. in making the site even better just to attract you back. Yeah, a good example is of that is um, in the Southern Highlands, um, you know, down in Barrel, south of Sydney, where we were playing at um, Centennial Vineyards for, you know, three or four years. But uh, we, would, we we would the venue would get really rain affected, so we probably cancelled you know four or five out of ten shows and our ins insurance premium increased dramatically which is a really big cost uh of business for us what's can you give me any sort of way is it oh, you, it, could, could, it could be four percent of of the gross gee yeah that's in, that would include artists not appearance as well but the, the um insuring for weather rain you know fire all that it's exp it's expensive now and I, you, you know you, you see the news you hear the news reports about you know people can't even insure their house in some of these flood prone areas well the same happens for us in some of the markets we play like the hunter valley and southeast queensland our premiums have gone up naturally because of you know what's happened in the last five years is that your number one biggest risk in running an event the weather probably weather yeah what would be your number two risk just bums on seats. Just bums on seats, yeah. But back to Bowral, um, he, the owner there, to his credit, you know, we had to stop doing that show because the insurance premium had gone up so much. So we, we, we stopped doing the show. The insurance premium went down. We probably haven't played in Bowral for 10 years. And the owner there just 
kept getting harassed in the supermarket and the service station and wherever he was about when are you doing more shows, when are you doing more shows. To his credit, he spent nearly a million bucks on another site on his property that has, which wasn't the old site because the old site was a big amphitheatre with a bloody dam behind the stage. You don't need to be a genius to know that the where the waters are going to go mm -hmm. as soon as it rains and you know being city folk we didn't really think that through but um anyway he spent a fortune on this other site um and it's a fantastic 12,000 capacity fully functional site and we've had uh crowded house play there we've got sting coming up we've got rod stewart coming up so we're back in barrel on a site that can handle the weather it hasn't affected our insurance premium I don't think people realise just how much money you do pump into a local economy mm. because of things like people driving there, they've got to fill their car up with, with fuel when they get there. Yeah. There's, there's own accommodation, not just the the your own expenses or what you're putting into that local economy, it's all of your patrons as well. The University of Tasmania did a study and they said that the ratio is three to one. For every, for every dollar spent at a live music festival, $3 is created to go into the local economy, which is a massive, yeah, massive. A, a massive amount. So they spent some time quantifying all of that. Um, well, just, just even, even just the other weekend, Ross, you know, you've got um, the state government helping out, you know, Frontier put on Billy Joel at the MCG for the only Australian show. There's 77,500 people at the MCG. So credit to the government for giving Frontier that support because they acknowledge the amount of money that's going into the Victorian, the, you know, Victorian economy, let's say, that, that day. And that day, that same day, we had 20,000 people down at Geelong for the Killers. The Meredith Festival was on. They've got 15,000 people there, right? And that's three high profile gigs, let alone what's happening in all the pubs, clubs all over Victoria in one night. That's one night. Right. So right there, there's over 110,000 people attending music shows, so, and plus all the other pubs and clubs. I think it's and it's a really, must... really very undervalued sector. But what, you, what you're saying is <clears throat> there's an explosion in this area. Mm. Demand is going up. Mm. There's people got to supply that demand with acts and whatever. Mm. You've been through the shift away from music being the profitable area for, well, record sales, mm. and now it shifted into your segment, the live right. music. That's yeah. now can just talk a bit about yeah. that being the predominant yeah. segment in, in the music industry now. Well, well, you can have a think about artists like the B-52s, the Pretenders, Blondie, Sting even. They might put out a record, a brand new album now that they've worked on for 12 months. They come to Australia and they say, we've got a new album out and they're gonna sell, like some of those artists might sell a like, thousand copies of that record here. Like, I don't know, do you wanna to listen to a new Blondie Pretenders Sting album with new, you know? <laughs> or do you wanna go see them live when they're playing all the hits? And they might have to, yeah, you know, we might have to suffer through a couple of songs from the new album, <laughs> but we want to hear we want to hear the hits. That's what people want to hear. And you know, when 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 you know Frank Stavala at Premier Artist, my old boss, he used to say, you know, with the day in the green, he goes, "Hum me three songs," and they should be on the bill. <laughs> you know, um, so th those artists like, you know, and w that we've toured very successfully, like Blondie, Simple Minds, um, B fifty twos. Pretenders, um, we've had a lot of success with uh, Cindy Lauper as well. We've had a lot of success with packaging them up on a, on a you know on one bill. Like we've had Pretenders and Blondie together, Cindy Lauper and Blondie together, Pretenders and Paul Kelly together, um, Simple Minds and the B Fifty Twos together. Was it? oh no yeah and, and Devo Simple Minds B Fifty Twos Devo I think it was. It was a great bill. Um, yeah, so we try and give people value for money in the package that we present at A Day in the Green. That's what we've always done since we started. That was the, that was the idea from the start, going back to how we started it. It was like to put contemporary bills 
in wineries. That was the, you know. And that's what people wanted and you yeah. and that yeah. built and you yeah. packaged. For yeah, that. so we, so, and then the other idea was like, you know, you can bring kids under 12 for free, which we still do. You can bring a picnic, you can bring a deck chair, you can bring a blanket, and you can sit around with your family and friends, you know, have a drink, have something nice to eat, and see some bands and go home. And it's, you know, one stage, one day. Okay. <clears throat> In economics, we always like to talk about supply and demand, and that gets back to pricing, and that gets back to tickets. There's this thing called elasticity, yeah. and that means you, you put the price of something up, and if it's elastic, not as many people want to buy it because they can't afford it. You know it. what? I wish we could do that ongoing as the show goes on sale, like airlines do. I'd, I'd love to be able to do that. that and I think we should be allowed to. But w yeah, we call, that, we call that flexing. So we might have um, four, four ticket categories. Um, so we'd have diamond at, diamond at the front. Let's say we go on sale with 1,500 diamonds. We might have gold behind that. Let's say we've got two and a half thousand of those. Let's say we've got 3,000 silver behind that. And they're all reserved seats, right? Behind that, we've got 10,000 GA. They're just numbers I'm pulling out. General mission. General mission, yeah. yeah. Um, we might go on sale and find that the demand for the diamond is not good. So we might move some golds into the diamond or vice versa. We might move some diamonds into the gold might move some silvers out and have to put more GA in. Because the GA is usually, usually, not always, but usually the most popular ticket. That's, I'm talking 100 and... Because it's least expensive? Yeah, yes, correct. And also, it's the experience of the GA, which I like uh, myself. I would be that person, like where I'm buying six tickets, I'm going with some friends, we're gonna sit around, we're gonna you know, have, some, have some beers and wine, have some food, watch some bands, have a chat, you know, be able to talk. There, yeah, the band's there, yeah. you know, but we're, we're here for the day. And you'll very often get, like, say you've got Simple Minds and the V52s, you might get, you know, two of those people in the six saying to the other four, let's go, this is gonna be really good because they're fans of the band and they drag four with them for the day. Then the other four end up having a good time anyway. Or you're gonna have someone who's a really big Simple Minds fan, and they just want to be in the diamond down the front. But that's, but that's an incredibly hard thing for you to pick, isn't it? Quantify, well, to actually know, well, okay. Well, oh. it's not, it's not. It sounds complicated, but it's not. And all, all you can do, and, and Michael Gadinsky, who, who was the, you know, the partner in my business for all those years, um, he was the best at it. And that's just reading the market and having an, an instinctual understanding of how much an artist should be, you know, what you're going to pay them and what the ticket price should be, you know, and what's the breakdown of that ticket price, you know. Or when we've got a venue like Geelong down at Mount Dunee, which holds 20,000 people, should our GA price there with 15,000 GAs or, you know, 12, be a little bit less than, say, the Hunter Valley where the capacity is 12 and we've only got, 6,000 GAs. But you, you know work I mean? that out on a break-even basis, don't you? You say, we've got this many seats and we need to sell so many of them mm. to break even with our costs. So, yeah, yeah. And then after that, we're looking at tweaking it. Yeah, so we've, we've been stuck before on budgeting for selling a lot of seats at a high ticket price, but can't move them. Well, we sell some, but we can't move them, but the GAs keep selling, right? So do we do we um, leave the GA sold out and hope that people are going to buy the seats, you know, the drip feed of sales over time, or do we just lose a whole section of seats and put it into the GA and sell them immediately? But that's a timing issue, isn't it? It's it's and it's just like you don't. You, there's no right answer. Like you, you know, you just go on what. Your gut is, and what, and, and you know, you look at your budgets, and you, you you think, well, okay, well, let's release 500 GAs, even though it's sold out, and see what happens. More often than not, they sell immediately, even if you don't promote it, you know, or or and that and that's when you're not selling any seats, or you're selling fuck all seats at the same so, time, you know. So how do you come up with the price of a ticket? It, it's usually it's always like any business, really reflected in your costs, you know.
So you know what your costs are. Yeah, so, I, if, so I, I, any of our venues, if I put all the infrastructure in, which is a greenfield show, so you've got to understand, you know, it, it's just grass. So everything that goes on that grass, I'm paying for. So, you know, our venues, you know, you'll think to yourself, well, that venue there, on an average ticket price of, let's say, 150 bucks, it's gonna, it, it's, it's four and a half thousand people break even before I even pay and promote an artist. So before I pay for and promote an artist, I've got, I've, I know I'm 4,000 break even, so on an average, t- or whatever average ticket price it happens to be. So then, you know, you put someone like Robbie Williams or Rod Stewart or, you know, um, Jimmy Barnes or Farnham or a- any any artist fee on top of that already existing 4,500, let's say. Yeah. Then you kind of know what you're in for and then you adjust the ticket price accordingly. So, you know, Robbie Williams' fee is going to be very different than John Farnham's fee. So, but he, but the ticket price you'll get for Robbie will be a lot more. So then, you've got to move. If we look at, if we look at ten thousand seats, mm. you know where your break even is for mm. your fixed costs mm. per se. Mm. But then you've got to put your, your talent, your entertainment act yeah. on top of that. Yeah, and that moves it more closer to your ten thousand seats. Yeah, and you've got a diminishing amount of profit margin at the top, haven't you? What's left over is what hopefully you're going to. Yeah, and take and, home. and you know, these days, um, you know, artists, those those bigger artists, um, you, you, you got, you know, we've done shows with Elton John, with Fleetwood Mac, Robbie Williams, you know, they're going to sell out for you if you price it properly. They will, it will sell out, right? So you you forecast a sellout for yourself <laughs> and you hope that you get it. But, you know, the break-even, I, I, you know, I'm, again, I'm pulling figures out of the air, but the break-even, let's call it a 10,000 capacity, let's call it a 20,000 capacity show. The break-even could be up around, you know, 18,000. 18,000? Yeah, which is a lot of people, right? So, and that includes the artist's fee? Yeah, Boy, that's pretty and fine. And I'm not, I'm not, well, it's fine, but you, it, you're going to get it, right? You're going to get it. What sort of percentage of the overall cost is the artist? I mean, that's obviously going to be very Well, yeah, the it, artist, it, it, it varies. But let's, let's say you're big, you're big international names. The percentage of the cost, it could be anywhere between 30, 40% to like 60%. It's a it's a massive cost. Yeah, so there's a lot of you know there's a lot of give there, um, you know. Um, look, I'm not getting, giving any way, in, giving away any trade secrets, but sometimes too the artist will be on a guarantee with a bonus after X amount of people that you work out with the with the agent. So you're paying them a guarantee, then we're going to make some money, and the artist is going to get a bit more if we get to X amount of payers, and I'll share that profit with the artist after. He's made his guarantee, I've made some money, then there can be a split between the artist and myself. Yeah? Right. Mm. And it's all, it all like, it's all shifting, it all changes, it all depends on the leverage, depends if the band really, really wants to play to Danny Green, depends if I really, really want the act and they've got other options, you know? Robbie could probably do another Amy Stadium instead of playing down at Geelong. So, and does that sometimes happen with other players? You're, oh yeah, you're, no, you're no. Competing well, a really good example is um, in Brisbane, the southeast Queensland market, where we've got a really hot venue, um, and it's, in my opinion, a better play than the Brisbane Entertainment Centre, which is out in Boondal. You know, and it's a bit of a pain in the ass to get out to Boondal. It's a very sterile environment, in my opinion. It's a great venue, but it's in Boondal. It takes a long time to get out. It's hard to get out of the car park. Um, and we are beautifully placed halfway between Brisbane and the Gold Coast. So we're drawing from even the North Coast of New South Wales, definitely the Gold Coast, definitely Brisbane. Um, and it's a stunning, when that venue is on and then we've got a beautiful night, it's, there's nothing like it. We had two nights with Crowded House there recently. You know, we had 13,000 people per night and it was 25 degrees and still and perfect. And you know, it doesn't get any better. Or you might 
have Elton John there for two nights and it might rain the first night and it's a bit muddy the second night but you still got Elton you know like when the outdoor experience is is good it's there's nothing better looking at costs so okay they might be 40 to 60 percent of, of your cost of your oh, sorry of your overall cost base you must have felt lately with inflation mm. a lot of your costs are going up mm. which are the ones that have stood out in your mind mm. that have gone up the most artists fee you know because they're in this same economy as us they're paying for international airfares they're paying for you know hotels are a cost i mean we 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 pay for the hotels but it's still it still ends up being a show cost if you, if you know what i mean like it's yeah you know um Artist fees are, and, and the other thing about an artist fee, artist fees too is Australia is a dream market for a lot of agents and managers because you've got four pretty good promoters um, who are TG, Chug, yep. Frontier, Live Nation. Then you've got you know Secret Sounds. Um, you've got other, other people coming up through the ranks. There's there's us as well. Um, so there's a lot of choice. So you, a lot of choice means for them they can up the ante. Yeah, like you're saying, you know, like um, I remember, you know, with that first Leonard Cohen tour that we did when he when he came back after disappearing for years. Um, you know, I think we had five or six shows on that first comeback tour, and we were in Michael's office and the agent, and we'd had, you know, Michael had had or we'd had an a joint offer in, into the agent for Leonard Cohen. And we were in his, Michael's office and there was an agent f saying, listen, you've had, you had the offer for so long now, you need to either, either confirm this or I'm gonna take it elsewhere. But you've got 10 minutes because it's just taking to, this is bullshit, it's taking too long. So I, we're sitting there, I got no clue on how big Leonard Cohen's gonna be. You know, this was back in 2010 or something like that, I think. Other people, someone else in the room said, nah, it's too much money, don't do it, don't do it. So other people were on the fence. And, and Michael, I just saw Michael go into himself, <laughs> go into his own and he says, nah, we've got to do it. It's fucking Leonard Cohen, you know? Rings the agent, we confirm it, done. So it was done. And then we go on sale, it's th it goes through the roof, of course. It was a game changer for a day in the green because we've got these in incredible shows with Leonard Cohen. I, I'm at the shows just like beside myself because it was that good. Um, but you know, but then even with Leonard, you know, we, we confirmed that tour when the dollar was uh, 97 against the US. And when we settled the tour, it was 63 or 64 cents. So in terms of exchange rates? We're, well, with that tour, we've got full houses and we're breaking even. Because, but, of, because of exchange yeah, rates? Yeah, because of the exchange, because you know, that's the, you know, Let's, I don't. I can't even remember what the artist fee. And I'm, and I'm not saying it's this, but if you've got um, uh, half a million dollar guarantee for an act in US, and you're confirming at ninety seven, and you're settling on sixty three, what's that? You're losing lots of one hundred fifty grand right there. So you, you've said to me that now you're negotiating in Australian dollars for these artists. Now that's the change. Yeah, that's that's the change. And um, there are few. Like I just know what we've got coming up, right, in the next two years, I'd say of the, of the things we're doing, five out of six are in Australian dollars and one's in American, one's in US. So yeah, that's where we're going. And I've got offers to other, other acts now that are, that are in Australia, which have been accepted. And previously I've worked with the same artists and I've paid them in pounds. And now it's going to be the good old Aussie dollar. Because you want to reduce your risk. I just want to know what I'm paying. And yeah. it's probably, you haven't got a person sitting somewhere in your organisation that's very good at predicting well, yeah, and, foreign and exchange. It, it, I, I did, we did have one. And even he always used to say, it's no point. He said, by the time you pay f to lock it in, you're going to lose the money and... You know what I mean? Like if just, it stays the it, same or better, you're worse it, off. So you're just it's gonna like, guess it the yeah, whole time. Yeah, but we're like any like any other importer, we we suffer because of it. With that, yeah. Give us some idea of the cost of these international acts compared to the Australian acts, and give me some idea of their pulling power compared to the local acts. 
Well, you can put a local lineup on and put six really solid Australian bands on and still draw 10,000 people, you know. But your average ticket price might be $130, $150, yeah. But then you'll have an, an international act with an average ticket price of you know, 180 or 90 and you're still pulling 10,000 people. So that difference there of that average ticket price is the, probably the difference in the fee. Right. You know, because I, my, 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 I mean, mostly my costs are fixed unless you have some, you know, a really big act like Robbie or Elton where there's like 60 or 70 people on the road and you've got to, ha you know, we've got to put them somewhere backstage and cater and, you know, the production's much bigger. Your costs are just... Yeah, it's just like, the, you know, a production for an Elton John show compared to a Noiseworks show, no disrespect to Noiseworks, um, is like off the chart different. It's on another planet different. Okay, so <clears throat> again, exposure, but you price accordingly. So yeah. if these artists are increasing their costs to you... Mm -hmm and that's the largest component cost in your, mm. your enterprise, mm. you're gonna pass that straight through a ticket price. Have to, well how else am I gonna get it? Yeah. It's like any other business, like in, you know, and that's what I was saying earlier, like you know, with the airlines being able to flex like at will, randomly, yeah. I wish we could, I wish we could say, oh, you know, we go on, say we went on sale, we gone, oh, this is like a lot hotter than we thought. I wish after a day, I could just put the ticket price up 20% across the why board. Can't, why can't you? I, uh, I think you, I don't know if it's even, you know what? I don't even know if it's against, what is it, ACC or? A triple C. A triple C, yeah. Or why we, can't you flexibly price your tickets so it's, it's a market, it's not against any law to be able to say the price reflects the market. That's what really the whole Australian economy is about, mm. is supply and demand and free market. I, 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 like just, from what I know, the reason we don't do it is because you just get too many complaints. About it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's against... It hurts your brand. Yeah, I don't think it's against any law. But, you know, there are, are, you know promoters are now finding very flexible ways of um, ticketing. Like you can sell aisle seats in arenas for more money than the middle of the row. You know what I mean? Okay. You can... Um, put some tickets on hold where there there might be sort of like an auction thing going on but again the promoter doesn't get that you know if you're on a if a artist on a percentage it's, well, it's going to the band it's not going to the promoter oh, the other day i was having a talk to michael roberts who's been hunter and collector's mm. manager for 40 years mm -hmm. he was telling me that taylor swift on one of her last tours she could fill seven times mm. the amount of seats she could sell seven times the amount of seats that was sold for that tour. For her, yeah, so she could have gone, yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. And, and, and I said to him, not being a wizard in the music business, I said, well, why on earth wouldn't she just then keep on increasing the price of mm. her tickets? Mm. So you're still only left with however many mm. venues she was gonna play at. Mm. But you, you've only, you, your costs are the same, but you're making a whole lot more money. And yeah. he said, because you just kill your fan base. Yeah. Well, with Taylor especially, you know, Ed Sheeran's another one where you're going to have probably mum, two mums, or a mum taking two or three kids. Um, and, you know, they're very savvy artists. They are very savvy artists. And they, they get their pricing right. Um, they don't want to dis disillusion people with high pricing. They don't want to gouge. You know, they've got to come back as well, remember. So when you say that, the, the, the way those, got, those guys tour is they tour, they sell out, there's still demand in the market, they put on a hot show, they've priced it well, and then they're setting themselves up for another tour, and the one after that, and the one after that. Ed Sheeran's and, and Taylor, like, Ed, Ed never, has never supported anyone in Australia. He's never done Splendour, he's never done a festival, he's always just come and it's been Ed. And, and Michael had so much to do with Ed's career globally, not just in Australia. Very, very much involved. He might, he's even got a statue of Michael in his bar at home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, he has. <laughs> Let's talk about COVID for a sec. Well, that was fun, wasn't it? 
That just mm. smashed you, didn't it? Yeah, smashed us. We um, had an enforced break. We postponed and cancelled so many tours. Um, we had everyone on JobKeeper. Um, it was extremely frustrating. Um, and, you know, I think the music business is very resilient. We're a very positive lot. Um, and we always had an eye to the future and we, uh, you know, we got by um, just, actually, just. Have you found that since, listen, I want to say COVID finished, but it hasn't finished, but in terms of now you, you've got a free system where you can run as much as you want, is there pent up demand and you're really seeing that in terms of ticket sales? People want to get out and have mm. great fun. There seems to be, but there, at the same time there's a lot of shows on sale at the moment. There's a lot of product out there. I think it feels to me right now that the market is a little bit tired. You know, we've had so many interest rate rises, you know, the inflation um, coming into Christmas, you know, discretionary income's tight. Do you, do you feel that? Oh, yeah. Do you see that you in see, terms you of your sales? Yeah, you see it when you go on sale. You go, oh, that's really a bit softer than I thought it would be. Or, you talk, you know, you talk to another promoter, you know, Michael Coppel at Live Nation or, or, or Chuggy, and they say, yeah, it's, got, it's, it's okay, but it's not as good as we'd have hoped. But the shows aren't till March, and I think we're going to be okay given we've got time. Do you look at things such as you mentioned discretionary spending then, interest rates are going up, mm. um, discretionary spending, the Reserve Bank would hope it's going to go down mm. because that's the reason why they're putting up interest rates. Do you look at that ahead and go, I'm going to change the type of acts that we're going to have at a day on the green because I think I'm going to have to rely more upon mm. what, older people that may have more money? Mm. It, we do what our philosophy is at the moment is back winners that is like the robbies and the rods and sting uh, florence machine um, don't do too much don't do too, too much um, there's already enough competition without us competing with ourselves you know um, so we we're careful, um, you know. There's so there's there's more tours coming next summer too. I can't tell you. It's just like the traffic. You, know, you, you always think, oh, it can't be any busier than it was last summer, but it ends up being the same, if not worse. You know. So, and I think you just got to you just got to put on quality shows. You know, I, I like to think that Day in the Green's got some sort of you know meaning or cachet or of putting on good shows. Um, and we just got to be really careful with our packaging of you know how, who we present and our ticket pricing, which we've been talking about. Let's keep it going. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me ask you a very specific question. Mm -hmm. I would imagine not a lot of people who listen to the Bergonomics podcast know this, mm -hmm. but I'd like to ask you what's more difficult: putting on a day in the green concert. Mm -hmm or including its preparation or preparing and swimming the english channel <laughs> of which you are I, one of the 1832 people to have done 1000 and what 832 yeah i heard the strike rate's only 10 percent, which is well, and only five thousand people have climbed mount everest so, yeah right you know, I mean, yeah. Well, boy you were even a very oh, select group look I, harder oh, the, the, the channel can, was definitely harder i can yeah. remember you going up and down that 50 meter pool at yeah. Insect. 15 mm. kilometres mm. every morning for how yeah. long? Months. 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 Well, I, 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 um, the first time I tried, I got beside us in the shoulder, so I had to stop. And I booked the pilot boat already. And so I, I think I lost my deposit on that, but I rebooked it for one year after. And then I sort of had a re gave the shoulder a rest, got some good... Um, body therapy around it. It had a really good myo and a really good acupuncturist. Anyway, I got through it, yeah, but that, that, the channel was a, oh, you know, when I think about it, actually starting a day in the green and all the energy and, the, you know, the, 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 the hard work that it took was, was pretty good. Like, but, you yeah, know, the channel was another level. Um, 
and you know the training was just ridiculous and the eating the eating was the worst like i'm 85 kilos now when i swam the channel i was 105 because you put that on because of the cold yeah and i just remember going you know um, we're here in albert park and going down and having um you know first of all i had breakfast then I'd, the morning tea would be an almond croissant and a chocolate big m <laughs> you know like nearly, nearly every day it was it's really hard to train when you're 20 kilos overweight <laughs> now that's not all you did you went on the manhattan race yeah too and got really sick got shockingly sick tell us about that well uh, i don't know what happened manhattan i was i was going really well and then we got up in, around the um it's the harlem river which is the top you start in battery park and you go up the east river yeah, yeah. And, and they were talking about it in the briefing um that when you get to the harlem river it becomes like it's fresh water not that it's fresh but i mean it's like do you know what i mean fresh water yeah it's not, I mean, it's not, not, not you're salt not, you're not buoyant yeah you're not buoyant and um and i remember hitting it and it was much colder and i could hardly see my arms in front of my body and it was really stunk it was really quite putrid and i came and i just I must have swallowed water. I don't know what happened, but I came out of that around the top of Manhattan, started going down the Hudson, and I got really, I felt really sick. Um, and luckily, the Hudson's got a tide going down towards Battery Park again. So that, there's a bit of tide assist there, but I was so sick. And my mum was there. We, she came to New York with us, and I got out of the water, and I, was, I must have looked bad, because I remember her saying, can someone call an ambulance? <laughs> Right, so I'm in the in the ambulance, and I go, I get to the um, to Beth Israel, what was it called? A big hospital in New York, anyway, and um, I'm there in my speedos. You know, there's her heroin overdoses, there's old people fucking dying, and you know, I'm just there in the bed in the speedos, and they've taken my oxygen levels, and it's 66 percent, right? And I said to the doctor, "What does that mean?" And they said, "Will you?" You really should be dead. <laughs> but I was in there for about four days. Um, in and intensive I, care for four I days. was in intensive care for a couple and then in the general ward with God. I, I, I can hardly re even remember it because I was sick, you know. Um, it came out of that and I was good as gold. I was, I was perfect after that. I came good really quickly. <laughs> Not many would, would equate what you do as a, jo a day job to the level of fitness required, commitment, self-discipline. Mm. Yeah, but they both do. They both require that. That, And that's probably the reason why you are very good at a day in the green, because yeah. you do have that. Oh, you know, and, I, and you know, I'm really, really fortunate that, um, you know, obviously swimming is a kind of a solo pursuit, but with a day in the green, I, I've got to say, I've just had the most incredible staff over the years who've worked hard with us, you know, Anthea, my wife, um, you know, just a, an unreal asset to, to, you know, push us all along. Having Michael as a business partner. Michael Gidinski. Yeah, it was just, like I said to him, you know, a couple of years ago, I said, Michael, I don't think I've actually, I sat, actually sat down with him when I was really happy that that happened. I sat down with him and said, I, I, I never actually said to you, you know, that I can't believe how lucky I am that you're my business partner. I, I said, if I'd have known that when I was like 30, that you were going to be my business partner for 20 years, I wouldn't have believed it. And I just want to thank you for like hanging in with us and, and being part of it and helping us. And, and um, yeah, we had a really, really good conversation after that. But, I, you know, um, Michael would get pulled every which way, you know, by people wanting this or that or the other thing, you know. Um, and yeah, I just yeah, really miss him. It's um, such a great guy. You know, just looking at it, that photo of him over there on the wall, he was he was a one-off. He really was. Mm. And I know you interviewed him at one stage, didn't you? I no. remember you you coming in here when I was at the agency. Yeah, yeah. I think I, you. I, I, I interviewed him, and what a character he! In fact, I think he he took me out to of some rock venue and we were somewhere as well and he was showing me the world and it's probably a world that I couldn't relate to and didn't mm. really understand mm. but I've certainly never seen someone with so much energy passion and enthusiasm mm. it was his total life oh, it was it was his life 20, you know, 28 days 28 hours a day yeah and and he'd get off the plane from London or LA 
and just go straight to the ESPY to see some band, unknown band, mm. and just do it with such joy, you know? Amazing. And I, I, said, I remember saying to him a few years ago, oh, how good is this? Like we were at some show that we'd, we'd put on together and I, he goes, I, I said, this is just the best. And he goes, have you fucking finally worked it out? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, we, should, we could be selling fucking photocopiers. Or well, hamburgers, as it is. Okay, that brings us to the big question. Mm. The ham, the Bergonomics test. Yep. Tell me mm. how a day on the green, mm. what effect it has on a simple hamburger. So I ask all, oh. all of my guests, you know... I've got so many hamburger stories for you. Okay. If you've got a minute, actually. Go for it. First of all, we had our 500 show recently and grilled hamburgers which is a great chain of hamburger shops they uh cook sliders for us in our 500 club we called it which is our you know friends and family of a day in the green and supporters so they were cooked us a whole lot of free burgers plus they had their um airstream burger an airstream is uh the big silver caravans they've converted that to a kitchen yep so they had their burger there um mcdonald's get smashed after our shows wherever if you go to mcdonald's in orange after a day in the green or mudgy or wherever mcdonald's is pumping absolutely pumping with every and we we'd sometimes go to mcdonald's in ringwood on the way back from the yarra valley we walk in and you just see so many casualties from a day in the green they're packed packed the other the, the best hamburger story is um my little mate over here at andrew's hamburgers in albert park Andrew, I used to play cricket with him. He was a kid and I used to pick him up. He used to be a leg spinner. And um, biggest Rick Astley fan. Hassled me all the time about when's Rick Astley coming, when's Rick Astley coming. Because when he was eight, he was a little Greek guy, his cousins were going to see Rick Astley at the Palais. He thought he was going. He was all dressed up and ready to go. The cousins came over, didn't have a ticket for him, burst into tears, eight years old. The next time Rick Astley tours, this is like 15 years later, He's the only show Andrew, uh, uh, sorry, Greg could go to, this is the kid, was the Chelsea Heights Hotel. You know that one down there? Actually, I haven't been there. That's it. <laughs> I've, I haven't either, but I've driven past it. But anyway, Rick was playing there, which is totally the wrong place for him to play anyway. So Greg's all excited, goes down to the Chelsea Heights Hotel, pumped. Like, I can't, this guy's a real fan, big fan. At the show, guy walks on the stage, Ladies and gentlemen, we're very sorry Rick can't perform tonight. He has a very bad case of food poisoning. Still get, doesn't get to see Rick Astley. That's why he keeps hassling me. So fast forward, I say, okay, Rick, I've got Rick Astley, Greg. He's coming. We're going to do this tour with AHA. And he's beside himself. And he goes, oh, my God. So we get, so that's that. So he's the owner of Andrew's Hamburgers, right? So I get to Perth, meet Rick and AHA for the first show of the tour. I tell Rick the story. And I didn't want to say too much, but I was hoping he would say, and he did. He goes, let's go and get a hamburger, <laughs> right? So we set it up. Rick's doing the ABC. Then he's got to do the project after that. So he's got an hour off. So I set it up with um, Greg's mum. I said, Mrs. Pappas, Rick Ashley's coming into the store. Greg has to be here at 6 o'clock on Wednesday night or whatever it was, right? So it's pumping in there. I've got Rick outside. It's like two or three deep in the hamburger store. Greg's behind the grill, very busy. I walk in with Rick. Greg sort of half turns around and said, who's next? And Rick puts his hand up and says, I am. <laughs> Greg looks, he drops the, the, scap, the spatula, whatever he's working with, starts shaking. <laughs> Rick goes around the counter. Greg can't believe it. He's Light beside himself. And anyway, Rick has the burger. He, um, Greg gives him a T-shirt. They have a photo out the front of them together in Andrew's hamburger T-shirt. It gets into the Daily Mail on page three in London. And um, so that, he was just so happy, right? And then uh, Rick says, we leave the burger joint, and Rick says, I'm going to do the project. I've got to do a live performance. I'm going to wear the T-shirt. I said, oh, gold. Um, so... I ring Greg and I said, oh, Rick's about to get on the project, you should watch it. So he's turned it on, he's got the Andrews hand. <laughs> <laughs> he 
<laughs> he's never like I get hamburgers free for life <laughs> at Andrew's Hamburgers, as do my staff. <laughs> so that's a real good hamburger story for you. That's the best one. But we we have uh, you know obviously yeah I know what you're saying. You, you're 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 just saying that whatever impact you have economically reflects in the good old purchase of a hamburger. Yeah, nice. Mickey Newton, thank you. Thank you, Ross. For joining us, you have demystified the uh, live outdoor mm. event business. Well, if it was easy, everyone would do it. Let's put it that way. But it's, uh, it's fun. I'm still enjoying it. Terrific. Thanks for, thanks for joining me. Thanks. Cheers. It was great to catch up with a close friend, Mick Newton, to peer into the economics of the mysterious world of live music events. The risks Mick has endured to stage 500 a day on the green festivals I personally find daunting. Patrons expect absolute 100% delivery from many aspects outside of Mick's control. Perfect weather, faultless artistic performances, plentiful local accommodation and no traffic jams with thousands of cars to be parked. In any enterprise, the higher the risk, the higher the return. But I never would have guessed profit margins are so slim in live events. Artist fees representing up to 60% of the total event cost. And historically, artist contracts have been negotiated in US dollars, meaning if the exchange rate moves against the Aussie dollar, the total profit of the event can be wiped out. Whether mix event makes a profit or loss, the total value of the event injects three times that amount into the economy. Lastly, never before has the Bergonomics test been explained with such immediate economic impact. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the Bergonomics podcast on Apple and Spotify and pass it on to others who you think may enjoy the demystification of economics. Jump onto our Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram and TikTok feeds with your opinion. Thanks for listening and I'll catch you next time. Thank you.